I mean, the title of the film, The Pieces That I Am, is so appropriate because you wove them together in, in, in a very brilliant way. And she was so layered. And so I just want to read you three quotes that I wrote down while I was watching the film, and then I'm going to let you talk about them. She's not afraid to be black. Mosley said, I want to read it but not live it. <laughs> and that it's the story beneath the story. So maybe you can speak about any of those. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I think, you know, Tony is telling her story here, and I, I used a technique I'd never seen before, which was that she talks directly to camera and the others talk off camera. And in a number of my films, the List series I did that Tony was an inspiration for, that's another story, everyone is direct to camera and they're kind of talking portraits. Thank you. But here I felt that if it would be interesting and maybe it would work, and once you go down that road and shoot it that way, you're stuck with it, uh, which is risky. But it seems that this was, it worked out that Tony really connects to you this way and everyone else is secondary, and that's kind of what I wanted. Uh, the Pieces I Am came, uh, it's, a, it's in, in uh, Beloved, and we were kind of playing with a subtitle, and at, around that time, I reached out to Micheline Thomas, who did this, the magnificent opening montage, collage, and I called her, I didn't know her, and I just called her up and said, you know, I'm doing this film on Toni Morrison, would you, take my photos and kind of do some kind of opening. And she said, I'm in, you know, like that. <laughs> and that was the reaction to all of the artists. You, there's almost 25 African-American artists whose work is in the film, from Aaron Douglas to Jacob Lawrence to Kara Walker, uh, Carrie James Marshall, all of these extraordinary artists. And all of them, the living ones, <laughs> gave us the work. And the estates were very gracious as well. To, to make it, and of course, all the archival footage that you had yeah. was just terrific. Uh, we were, you know, Tony allowed us into her personal archive and then opened, uh, gave us permission to go to Princeton and Columbia has a, an archive, and Johanna Giebelhaus, the editor, went out to Lorraine with a Super 8 camera and shot some of the sidewalk and some of the buildings <laughs> there and, and went into the archive in Lorraine. There's a small historical society and had they had magnificent pictures that no one had ever seen really so when you see the tony's talking about her friend who wanted the blue eyes and you're seeing pictures of lorraine at the time those are from that historical society from that period yeah. that's just amazing so you've had a 38 year relationship with tony which is pretty special um tell us a little bit about how the film, how you came to make the film. I'm sure everyone has asked you this. Well, I, a couple of years ago, uh, let's say six years ago, I started to feel that it was kind of now or never and that I needed to, if I was gonna do this film, I needed to do it. And around that time, I had made a film called The Women's List and Tony had written an introduction for it and we went up to see her uh, to record it and, um, talked a little bit about it then as well. And she didn't say no. You know, she, she is someone who has never allowed a biography. She won't write, she didn't want to write an autobiography. She really wanted to write, it was about her work, not about her. The Chloe, Tony, <laughs> uh, as you will. Uh, and she, you know, when she didn't say no to me, I kind of took that as a yes. <laughs> and I think she, you know, Tony was very, very aware of the power of film. And I think she was, um, she understood in some way that this could be a, a very good document, that it could work, and she trusted me. Uh, she knew my work very, very well. She'd seen all the films I had done um, and had been the inspiration for The Blacklist, the first of the list films. Came out of an idea, Tony and I were sitting at lunch, uh, we were shooting portraits for Margaret Garner, the opera. And she said, we should do a book on black divas, because I've interviewed so many black divas. And that idea 
became the blacklist. Uh -huh. So she, uh, you had a creative uh, relationship as, as well, yeah. But you know, it's, it's astounding when you watch the film and she says, I'm a writer, you know? But she's also an extraordinary speaker. I mean, she's captivating. She's the greatest storyteller, and you, you're mesmerized by her. Yes. I mean, just When we were sitting there in those interviews, just kind of was breathtaking. And Tony's so conscious of you know every word she says. She's so good at sort of scripting a little story. Even that story about her great-grandmother uh, who c comes to town and she and her sister are sitting on the floor. That story is so beautifully constructed, uh, yes. you know, it's yeah. amazing. Yes, and the detail, yeah. she remembers the detail, yeah. Um, so we have so many people here, so can we, do you, let's open it up for some questions. Yes. I thought the film score was extraordinary. Thank you. Magnificent. Uh, Catherine Bostick, yeah, Catherine Bostic. Uh, so wonderful. Otherwise, it would have been another show. Thank you. So I'll tell her. <laughs> She'll be very happy to hear it. Catherine Bostic is someone we discovered. Um, we kind of found out about her music a little bit. And I called her up again, cold. And I just said, I'm doing this film. And she said, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> she said, I'm in. You know, uh, whatever you want to do, I, I have to do this. And we would send her uh, kind of finished uh, sections, and she would score them and send them back to us. And we changed very little. Uh, even in the beloved section, she's singing. That's her in the background there singing. She did a fabulous job. Thank you. Here. Thank you for a beautiful documentary. Did Tony get a chance to see it perform at the moment? She did. I, went to, I took it to Tony and sat with her and watched it. And at the end, I said, you know, what did you think, Tony? And she said, I liked her. <laughs> That's perfect. That's just a perfect comment she would make. Yeah. Some other questions? I saw some hands up somewhere. Yes, right here. Yeah. Was any of the art uh, specifically created for the film? What a great question. Yes, there was one piece. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, when you see all of those single frames of, and then the images of her, like the one on the wall, and you're like, somebody put a portrait of her on a wall somewhere. A pill and well, I thought, you know. Those were existing. The murals were existing in the world, and, and we got pictures of them. But the, the only piece that we, we didn't have, I'm going to be very delicate how I say this, we couldn't license for a fair price, the picture we wanted of Tony and Angela Davis. There's a great picture out there. And the photographer was not lovely. So, so I'll put it. And um, I commissioned the artist who did the uh, illustrations for Beloved to do that picture of Angela, that kind of illustration of Angela and Tony in the typewriter. So that was the only one we commissioned, but everything else is an existing work. The, you know, the Jacob Lawrence migration series is so famous and so perfect as Tony's talking about her family's migration. Yeah, it was a joy to kind of look at art for this film and try and find pieces that would work well. It was beautifully constructed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, right here. I think that the answer to that is that it's very difficult being famous. And I, and I know I was very good friends with Lou Reed, and there was kind of Lou Reed, the public person, and Lou, the private person. And it's just hor horribly hard. It's, it's, it's terribly hard to you know, be there for people and their expectations. And I think Tony needed that separation herself. Um, you know, the outpouring when she died, uh, I was talking to Salman Rushdie, who said he'd never seen so much grief over the death of a writer. And I think it's, it, you know, 
imagine that and that you're Tony and you're going in the streets and people see you, it's just difficult. So I think she needed to keep separate. There was another question right there, yes? Did you all hear that question? No. Okay. Her, her sons, um, you know, one of her sons is dead, um, and I and her, her other son has his own life, is quite busy, is an architect, and you know, I think there's a lot about Tony's family in the film, and we kind of wanted to bring it in, where she she talks about how important they were, how she reaches out to them for their advice when Oprah. Uh, wants to do the film. Fran talks about how she dealt with her children as a writer and as a working woman. So we, and, and of course, throughout it are references to her parents and her grandparents. And so we brought family in in a different way than, than just have interviews with her one son. Yes, right here, second row. <laughs> We have three historic black American communities here in Sag Harbor that uh, recently got designation statewide in, on the National Register. Um, in writing about these communities before, um, before we got the designation, lots of the local publications said that we, we chose to live together. We were forced to li live there because of Jim Crow laws. We wanted to live there because we wanted to be with our own folks. And we went through great uh, effort in order to do that. And so that's, that's, I perceive that as insulting and condescending. Just as you want to live with your friends, we want to live with ours. So <clears throat> looking at this now, I don't think that message has gotten out as broadly, Tony's message I'm talking about, has gotten out as broadly as perhaps it should. That's my response. <clears throat> so, um, thank you for doing this. I mean, it was beautiful and, and difficult to watch. It's very similar to reading one of her novels. But my question is, in the stunningly horrific stuff that you came across, was there anything that you would want, would have rather not know? It's hmm. a good question. <laughs> uh, is there anything I would rather have not known? Well, uh, there's lots of things in life I'd, I'd rather have not known. Um, you know, the, the hardest part in making this film was to keep it at this length. You know, we had enough for five hours, ten hours. There was so much extraordinary material, even from the the 12 people we interviewed. Um, there was a 13th person, Peter Sellers. Tony had worked with him at Princeton. And they had a, uh, we had a kind of a seven minute piece on Shakespeare uh, that was just riveting, I mean, incredible. We pulled it. Because it was a, a way to kind of pull out something, you know, easily. So the, I really think, you know, it could have been a longer film. If it's two hours, and there's a lot in it, but, but yeah, <laughs> it's in the uh, it's, Ken in the, it's in the DVD, the the the, the Shakespeare part. Um, <laughs> Thank you. There's a question over here. Uh, 
coming in circles. Right. But where I'm going with this is that, uh, I don't know how many people know, but that Tony is known worldwide with her benches. Yes. That, and I wondered if that was a metaphorical thing about the bench at her dock that marks where historical black moments have happened. And I did stumble across one of those benches while doing a road trip in the Carolinas. Uh -huh. And so I feel this very touched thing about you showing the bench at the end of the dock. Mm -hmm. Was that? It was, a, it was a subtle um, touch just for you. We had in the Peter Sellers thing with Tony, we were talking about Shakespeare, and she says, I like the comparison about Shakespeare. She says, but in the end, Shakespeare wins. Aww. And then she explains why. Oh, I so. so yeah. Yeah. Did Tony f f fulfill one of her goals, which was to help to have black people feel that they had accepted their blackness and not need to be white? Yes. You know. I, I can, I've learned to never uh, answer for Tony. Uh, I, I think that we, you know, again, I go back to when she died, the, the, the grief for Tony. So I think that she has clearly meant so much to, to people all over the world. Um, and, you know, there are people who relate to the bluest eye who are Japanese, who, who see that book in, in, their, in their own metaphor. So I, I think, Tony speaks a you know a big a big language. It's a very big universal statement and language that she, that comes from her. Looking around, it's very hard to see with lights here. Yes, way up there. There's a there's a it's about Tony's confidence. You know, when I photographed her in 1981, I, someone asked me, "What do you remember of that shoot?" 38 years ago. And I remember how confident she was as a subject. And as a photographer, you're always kind of trying to read the nervousness of your subject. You're trying to make that person feel comfortable. And Tony was very secure. I remember it very, very well. Because most subjects are not. They're, they're nervous about how they're going to look. And Tony was not that way. And I think you know, she had that presence always, uh, a kind of a serenity and a sense of who she was that even despite, like, I mean, there's awful things that people said when, the, when she won the Nobel. I mean, imagine that moment of, of kind of, here's this moment where you're finally getting this tremendous award and, and accolade and, and the Washington Post comes out with that article. You know, it's just appalling. But you also capture that serenity in your photographs of her. She, she yes. once said to me that she, that she allows me to see the real her. <laughs> yeah. So, which you, the subject can do. <laughs> yeah. You could step a, an, behind that line. Right. Any, Sorry, yes? I just wanted to, to say that I thought your opening credits were brilliant, the way you put the pieces of her together. I was so moved yes. by that from the very beginning. Yeah. Congratulations on such a wonderful film. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Thank Timothy. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.